There's this perception that science and scientists discover things by by total accident, right? That that we're just blundering our way through the universe and we we hardly ever understand the experiments we're doing. We don't really understand the implications or and, and it's like random discovery, random discovery and we're like, "Oh wow." And then we get the Nobel Prize and then and then we learn and it's and and that certainly happens. Don't get me wrong. There are some very fundamental and important discoveries that happen purely by accident. But the vast majority of science happens by deliberate, careful experimentation where we design experiments where there's a mystery that something we don't understand or direction we want to push in. And we design an experiment to test that one thing and then measure it and do a really good job. And then that unlocks understanding. And I think the story of our understanding of the atom really, really highlights that process because the story of the atom, of how we came to fully understand that matter is made of atoms, is like a century long story, multi-generational. There was no big moment no big one thing that immediately flipped everyone's minds from no atoms to atoms. And it was, it was no like giant accident. There was no, you know, mad scientist working in a lab and accidentally combines two things. And oh, oh, by the way, atoms exist. No, it's a result of a century of very deliberate and careful investigation to how the universe works. And it starts in the early 1800s. Well, it, it can really start anywhere uh, because philosophers especially have been debating back and forth forever about whether atoms exist. But the scientific study of the atom, the physics and chemistry of the atom started in the early 1800s with, um, you know, let's let's pick John Dalton. You know, a, a, a major figure in that period who was looking at combinations of elements. And by this time, we knew that elements were a thing, that there were some fundamental components, if you will, that when arranged and combined together made more complex things. And, but the big question, the big question was, if I have a, a pure element, like if I have a bottle of mercury and I divide that, chop that bottle in half. Now I have half a bottle of mercury. And then I chop that in half and I have a quarter bottle and an eighth and a sixteenth and a one thirty second, one sixty fourth, one one twenty eighth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can I keep chopping that up, that pure element up into infinity? Can I just keep going and going and going and going and going? Or will I stop? Will there be a fundamental indivisible amount of mercury that I can no longer chop up? Are there mercury atoms is the big question. And John Dalton was playing with mixtures of elements of various combinations. And we had known for a long time that you can take two elements and combine them together in different ways, in different ratios, like say tin and oxygen. Like you can put this much tin and this much oxygen and put them together. Or you can do a different amount of tin and a different amount of oxygen and they'll combine together and make, make a, a molecule or a combination. We weren't quite sure about the whole molecule thing back then. And he noticed something funny about the ratios that only certain combinations of, of elements were allowed. And if you took the ratios of the of the elements like, okay, this allowed combination over here, I have this much oxygen. And then I have this allowed combination. I have a different amount of oxygen, but if, if I divide or I take the proportion of this oxygen over here and that oxygen over here, it always comes out to be a very small ratio, like one to two or one to three or two to five. It's it's always these integer ratios that tend to be very, very small. And he argued very, very convincingly from that, that atoms exist. That 
the only way to make sense of these observations is if each element has an atom and you're taking one atom and combining it from one element and taking it with one atom from another element and mushing them together, or you're taking two atoms and mushing it together with one from the other, or, or three from over here and two from over here and mushing them together. That's the only way to explain those kinds of ratios that he was observing. So that was a convincing argument, but of course the atoms were themselves were too small to be seen. You can't actually see the atom. You can only infer the existence of the atom from these properties of the mixtures that you're putting together. So kind of like that idea was like, well, that's neat. Maybe there are atoms, maybe not, but we can't measure it. Let's move on. And then in the mid 1800s, people were really getting fascinated with thermodynamics, with steam engines, with heat and temperature and pressure and entropy. And at first, at, a, at the first crack of understanding like how steam engines work, it was all like really vague. Like uh, I can put a thermometer in there and there's a temperature and I can re measure the pressure and the volume and there's the relationship between the gases and, and isn't that neat? But we have no idea why. We're just like discovering these relationships. But in the mid 1800s, we were able to understand, we were able to put our understanding of gases inside of a steam engine on a on a stronger physical ground by saying oh you know if if let's pretend this gas that's inside of a piston of a steam engine is really composed of zillions of tiny particles they're all zipping around like crazy Oh, 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 then we can understand pressure. Pressure is when the net effect, the cumulative effect of all these tiny little particles just slamming into the wall like that. And, and transfer of heat is if I have a cold thing and a hot thing, the hot thing is really jiggling around all its little tiny particles. And then we put it up against the, the cold thing and, and, and that starts jiggling together. And then they start, that's flow of heat. That's, that's, that's transfer of, of energy. That's temperature. It was... Uh, an understanding of thermodynamics through the properties of, of tiny, tiny little particles that you couldn't see. And so by the late 1800s and the early 1900s, plus you had things like Mendeleev's uh, periodic table, where you're starting to see relationships between the elements, uh, you're getting more advanced chemistry, you're starting to put together this picture that, hey, maybe atoms exist. But still, you can't see the atom. You can't measure the atom directly at this time. And the final, like, notch, like, just the, the, the final thing that, that gave people the confidence to believe that atoms exist was, was Albert Einstein himself. He was investigating this very curious problem called Brownian motion, which was discovered a century before, where if you drop relatively large things like a pollen grain, a seed, you know, whatever, just something in a fluid and you watch it, the thing will just start jiggling around. It'll follow like a little random path like this. Like that's all it does. And at first you're like, okay, maybe there's like currents in the fluid. Maybe, maybe my breath is, you know, I'm breathing on the thing and that's making it move. But you, you're a good scientist. You do all the hard work. You isolate that. And like, no, it's just moving on its own. You're like, well, maybe it's alive. You know, it has a little flagella or something. But then you start doing with like flecks of dust and, and bits of rock and stuff that's never been alive ever. And it does the exact same thing. You can see this yourself. You can see Brownie in motion yourself. If you look in a window and there's sunlight coming through the window and you look at the dust that's in the air, some of the motion from the dust will be from air currents. will just, you know, wave around like this. But look carefully at the dust. You will see little, little jiggles and wiggles in the motion. That's Brownian motion. Relatively unsolved problem for a hundred years. And then Einstein being Einstein and really smart, took a look at this problem. He said, well, I, you know, all my friends who study thermodynamics say that fluids and gases are made up of just a bunch of little particles. We've got John Dalton back there saying, you know, elements come in, in tiny little bits called atoms. Well, if all these atoms 
all the particles that make up the fluid, if they really are particles and thermodynamics is right and they're all jiggling around like crazy, if I drop something in there, they're going to hit it, right? They're going to slam against my little pollen grain or whatever. And then, and then just by pure random chance, they will just nudge it around. They'll just push it. I'll do it this way so you can actually see it. They'll just push it like maybe, you know, the countless interactions just on average will, will tend to push it this way. And then the next moment, they'll push it that way. And then a little bit down and a little up. And what Einstein did was he did a full math treatment of that problem. Like he analyzed it with math, which was Einstein's specialty. And he came up, he came up with a connection between the size of the particles, the size of the atoms in the fluid, in the motion of your pollen grain, the thing that's being nudged around. So here is a direct observational hook into the world of the atoms because you can watch that pollen grain. You still can't see the atoms, you can't see the particles, but you can watch that pollen grain and you can measure how much it moves, how quickly it moves, the space that it explores. That's stuff you can do in a microscope. And then Einstein's math said, okay, if it moves this much, then the particles around it must have a certain size and a certain mass. You can derive that. And then he was able to get from that calculation very familiar numbers like Avogadro's constant. Not too shabby. That was a direct connection. And that... That wasn't the final word in the story of the atom, but it was a serious, serious piece where it's like, okay, we have a coherent picture here, folks. Every experiment, every observation we do paints another little, it's another little puzzle piece. And then when you finally have all the pieces together, you're like, uh, we have a theory here, guys. Atoms exist. So you go, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like or subscribe and subscribe. Do it all and go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to help me keep doing this thing. And I'll see you next time.